Welcome and thank you for standing by. For the duration of today's call, all, comp all participants will be on the listen-only mode. At that time, you may press star 1 on your phone to ask a question. I would let now like to inform all parties that today's call is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. I would now like to turn today's call over to your host, Ms. Antonia Jeremillo. Thank you. I would like to turn today's call over to Antonio Jeremillo. Thank you. You may begin. Good afternoon. I'm Antonia Jaramillo with NASA's Office of Communications. Engineers and technicians have just completed the pre-test briefing to prepare for the Space Launch System rocket and Orion spacecraft to roll out to the launch pad 39B at NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida for the first time. At the launch pad, the rocket and spacecraft will undergo one of the final tests known as the wet dress rehearsal, before launching the Artemis One flight test around the moon. Here to talk with us about the recent operations and provide an update on preparation for Artemis One are Tom Whitmire, Associate Administrator for Exploration Systems Development at NASA Headquarters, Charlie Blackwell Thompson, Exploration Ground Systems Artemis Launch Director at NASA's Kennedy Space Center, John Honeycutt, Space Launch System Program Manager at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center, Howard Hugh, Orion Program Manager at NASA's Johnson Space Center, and Mike Serafin, Artemis One Mission Manager at NASA Headquarters. After a brief opening comments from each of our speakers, we will take your questions. You can enter star one on your phone to be entered in the question <coughs> queue at any time. Your phones are on mute now, and the operator will open your mic when we're ready and close your mic after you ask your question. We ask that you please stick to one question and identif identify to whom your question is directed. Shortly after we conclude, you can listen to a replay of this teleconference online. First, we will hear from Tom Whitmire. Tom? Okay, Antonia, thank you very much. Hey, um, I'm here today, I'm here with Charlie and Howard and John and Mike in person, and uh, we're really super excited uh, about this. Everybody at the Kennedy State Center is really excited uh, about where we're at right now. Uh, for folks, uh, you know, the first to the rolling out of the VAB, that's really an iconic moment for this vehicle. And to be here for a new generation of a super heavy lift exploration class vehicle, Thursday is going to be a day to remember, and we're really excited about that. Uh, you know, I think it's a tremendous day for the country, our aerospace community, and our international partners that will be part of this journey. Uh, so in a few minutes, I'm going to turn it over to Charlie, and then John, and then Howard, and Mike. Uh, but before I do that, I just want to talk about a couple things about the vehicle. And then afterwards, we're going to have a, we'll have another session, Antonia. We'll, we'll do one right before the wet dress rehearsal, and then we'll have one after the wet dress rehearsal, and then we'll have a final session before launch. So we'll have plenty of opportunities to answer questions along the way. Uh, but let me talk about the vehicle. So you're about to see a really incredible vehicle. And uh, most people don't talk about this. They talk about the size of the vehicle or what, 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 how, how much thrust it has. I want to talk about the people behind the vehicle for a few seconds, and then I'll turn it over to these other folks so they can talk about getting ready to roll it. You know, for SLS, Orion, and Exploration Ground Systems, we have over 3,800 suppliers in all 50 states of this country. Uh, the program creates jobs and people and communities throughout the country. I come from a small community in western New York. I have people in that area that work for this, for this activity. And, uh, and it's, a lot of people throughout the entire country really takes pride in what the NASA program is doing. This is a flagship rocket you're about to see. It's a symbol of our country, our communities, our aerospace economy, and once again, the partnership behind it. Uh, so, you know, a lot of times when I walk around, I live in D.C., you'll see people wearing NASA shirts. And I think when you walk to other parts of the country, you see people wearing NASA shirts. And uh, let me just say for everybody out there, the people that read these articles, uh, that filled out our passport, we have an Artemis passport that a lot of people, over a million people have filled out, who are mm -hmm. going to watch this rollout or watch the launch and even watch the journey to the moon and back, that we're really grateful to have you part of our team. And we really uh, think that that's a great part of what we do. This type of work is uniquely challenging. This kind of vehicle is a very difficult vehicle because it's such a capable vehicle. It's an exploration class rocket. And uh, so I'm just going to spend one, one couple more seconds and then we'll, we'll turn it over to the other folks. Just, I just wanted to, I didn't think I would really be doing it justice since I didn't also thank 
the folks throughout this agency who have helped made this day possible. We're here, we're fortunate we get to see it in person. There are people throughout this agency who have been working on this vehicle to get it ready for today. And these are women scientists and men scientists, rocket scientists, engineers, technicians uh, at facilities throughout our NASA centers. So we have folks at the Ames, uh, uh, ArcJet, uh, Ames Research Center in the ArcJet facility. We've got people at Langley uh, who do wind tunnel stuff. We have bipropellant testing at the White Sands. Glenn does, uh, Goddard Space Flight Center does deep space communication and then planetary design uh, at JPL. Thermal back testing at Glenn, uh, engine testing at Stennis, manufacturing development at MAP, materials testing, structural testing, software testing at Marshall, uh, environmental testing, crew training, human factors at the Johnson Space Center, and the ground system uh, development activity at KSE. And this is just kind of a handful of things. It, it takes a, a large number of folks working in different areas on different technologies, women and men, uh, rocket scientists, to really um, have a vehicle like this that we're about to roll out. We think it's a value to the country, uh, besides the physical hardware that you're about to see. The Orion program alone, Howard will talk about Orion here in a few minutes, had over 900 design analysis and test reports that we provided to some of our other NASA spacecraft providers. So it's a national investment, and from my perspective, it's a strong national investment on international engagement in our economy. Uh, and so with that, I'm, I'm really grateful for that. We're grateful that we have bipartisan support and support across a number of administrations. And uh, so when you see this rocket, it's not just a piece of metal that's going to sit at the pad. It's a whole bunch of people, rocket scientists throughout this country, uh, throughout our agency that have worked on this. And on behalf of them, we're really proud to present it to everybody else on Thursday. And with that, I'm going to talk to Charlie. She'll talk about bringing the rocket out to have a look. All right. Thanks, Tom. Hello, everyone. I'm Charlie Blackwell Thompson. I'm the Artemis Launch Director. And, uh, you know, Tom touched on it, but teams here at Kennedy and really across the country have been working <coughs> diligently leading up to this milestone known as rollout and preparing for wet dress, which is to come, and I'll talk about that uh, in just a few minutes. You know, we've been busy in the VAB, in the Vehicle Assembly Building. We had a, a, uh, a test regime that looked at all different facets of the integration uh, between the elements, between the ground systems, the communication systems. We did functional checkouts and most recently uh, finished up some of our flight termination uh, testing, flight termination system testing. We also performed a countdown sequencing test uh, that was a software test of our launch configuration. And all of these are really leading us up to our readiness to roll. Um, we just finished up our pre-test briefing a few minutes ago, or maybe just maybe a little about an hour ago. So uh, it's uh, it is uh, hot off the press, but this is a very exciting time, and I'm happy to report that as we went through our briefing materials and we looked at the readiness of the pad, looked at the readiness of the vehicle, of the launch control uh, system and the launch control center, as well as our teams, uh, we are in in very good shape uh, and ready to proceed with this role on Thursday evening. So it's going to be just a wonderful, um, wonderful sight when we see that amazing Artemis vehicle cross the threshold of the VAB and we see it outside of that building for the very first time. I think it's going to really be, be breathtaking um, and it'll be something really special uh, for me and I know for everyone that has worked on this and who gets an opportunity to see it. And let's see, with that, I'll, I'll hand it over to, to John. Thank you, Charlie. I'm John Honeycutt. I'm the SLS Program Manager. Um, it's really exciting to be here today. Um, we're really looking forward to uh, seeing the rocket roll out uh, this week. There's, uh, you know, there's been a lot of testing going on with the rocket. The, the, the kind of the big test that you saw last was the green run at Stennis. Um, but there are literally uh, thousands of component level tests and system level tests that have occurred uh, to get the rocket to this point. And, and Charlie talked a little bit about that, you know, because this is the first time uh, that the rocket's been fully integrated and gone through a series of, of integrated test and checkout in the VAB. Uh, one of those was uh, the modal test that we did. Um, we're almost finished with that, but we're going to be taking some additional measurements on the roll to the pad, and so we'll have uh, engineers gathering that data and uh, transmitting it to the analyst 
uh, as we're rolling to the pad. So we're looking forward to getting that. Uh, so I would just I would just say that uh, I'm extremely proud of the team. The Rockets uh, buttoned up. Uh, the whole enterprise has worked tremendously hard together as one team to get us to where we are today. So with that, I'll turn it over to Howard Hughes, the Orion Project Manager, Program Manager. I'm sorry. Yeah. Good afternoon. I'm uh, Howard Hugh. I'm the Orion Program Manager. So thank you, John. Uh, let's see. You know, uh, I think uh, you've heard the excitement in our voices. Uh, it's a great week for the agency and, and all our programs. Uh, certainly, I'm looking forward to seeing Orion launch on Artemis One with this rollout of a, of a great uh, launch vehicle and a spacecraft that's going to kick off a new era of human space uh, flight exploration. Um, you know, we've done a tremendous amount of work. John mentioned about his testing. Uh, we've certainly done our share of testing across uh, thousands of components as well, and, and uh, we've proven that uh, the, ready, the vehicle is ready to go. You know, through all that effort, it's been a culmination of a tremendous amount of work by not only our, our NASA Civil Service, but a uh, dedicated team across the country of many uh, contractors and, of course, our European partners as well. You know, Tom mentioned 50 states. I think Orion covers almost 50 states, um, and they play a very important role in all the pieces and parts of Orion. We also have uh, 10 European countries that have uh, supported us and, and provided uh, hardware uh, on the Orion spacecraft. So very uh, important partnerships that we have with international partners and also across the country with all these great companies that we've been working with. Let's see, you know, Artemis One is such an important um, mission for us, not just to get our first step uh, to human space exploration and continue that for the agency and the country, but also it's gathering very critical engineering data and validating our performance capability as a spacecraft for our next mission and beyond, Artemis II with the crew and future missions uh, as we go further uh, and expand our capabilities uh, in the solar system. And of course, uh, you know, a lot of subsystems that are, are critical to our success, like the heat shield and generating power, and of course, uh, making sure that we can land and uh, return the crew home safely is an important aspect of what we want to prove on this Artemis One mission. You know, I, I, I would say I could not be prouder of the team, uh, our team, uh, what they've accomplished so far, um, and what we're about to accomplish with the entire Artemis team. It's just a, a, a dream and a, and, a, and a great opportunity for everybody as we are able to embark on Artemis One. And on behalf of the Orion team, um, we are ready to go. Thank you. And I'll turn over to Mike Serafin. Thank you, Howard. Uh, this is Mike Serafin, the uh, Artemis mission manager. and. Um, to emphasize what Charlie and John and Howard talked about, our operations teams, whether it's Charlie's launch operations team or uh, Rick Labrode and the flight operations team out of Mission Control in Houston, or the recovery operations team and, and Melissa Jones on, on the, um, the Navy ship that will be at sea, um, we continue to get familiar with the hardware and the software um, from all of the testing that, that's been done, the thousands and thousands of tests, but also the integrated test here at the Cape. We continue to train together as a team, uh, one team, to get ready for this one flight, this first flight of the uh, lunar campaign that will eventually allow us to go on to Mars. Uh, we had a, a recent training event, uh, I would call it a proficiency training event, because the team is, is ready right now, and we will continue to maintain that readiness status until the flight hardware is ready. Um, but on um, early March on the 2nd, we did a, uh, a recovery uh, landing site selection simulation. And when we come back from low Earth orbit at the International Space Station, you know, we're 250 miles away from Earth. And we can watch the weather right up to the point where we undock and come home and commit to come home that day. But for uh, Artemis missions, when we come back from the moon, it's a very different um, situation. And we train that. Um, just, uh, just inside of two weeks ago. And when we come back from the moon, it's about four days coast at, at a minimum, uh, and a quarter million miles away, we're about a thousand times farther away from Earth. And the weather we get is what we get um, in the Pacific Ocean. We've set our entry trajectory line. And uh, what we can do to manage the, uh, the landing site conditions and the weather conditions is to change our landing site up and down that trajectory line. So we can go over a thousand miles uprange if we want from our nominal landing site. And we, and we train together uh, to, to understand the weather, 
the health of the spacecraft and our uh, ability to position the ship to receive the spacecraft at the chosen site to, uh, to manage through the uh, weather conditions that are unique to lunar return missions. And the team um, did extraordinarily well. Um, in addition to that, we are well into our flight readiness review process, which is a thorough wire brushing of our understanding of the mission ahead and our ability to achieve mission success, as well as the holistic risk to mission success. And the team has, has again, through, through John Honeycutt's um, Space Launch System Program uh, review and Howard's Orion Program review and a number of other reviews that have been conducted, demonstrated that they, that they are ready and understand the risk and are very clear about communicating what those risks are. And we'll hear more about those as we head towards the agency flight readiness review that will um, be led by Jim Free. But overall, um, I would just say that uh, when we see the rollout for wet dress rehearsal, we need to, to, to just be mindful that um, there were thousands of hands that touched the software and the hardware and the vehicle came in uh, piece parts. Uh, some of them are very, very large. 212 foot tall was our core stage when it arrived. But when we see the 322 foot tall rocket roll out, it will be one, just like our industrial base, like our international partnership. And it'll be a physical representation at rollout of what we're gonna see um, the team come together. And um, I'm very excited about, about Thursday. So that's it for me. I'll turn it back to Tony. Thank you. We will now begin the question and answer portion. Please remember to stick to one question and ident identify to whom it is directed. If we have time, we'll allow reporters to ask a second question. Again, you can enter star one on your phone to be entered in the queue at any time, and you can enter star two if you'd like to be removed from the queue. First up, we have Irene Klotz from Aviation Week. Thanks very much. Um, for Tom, if the uh, rollout uh, is able to take place and get to the pad within, you know, the 12 hours or so on the Thursday evening, what is the time and date that fueling would start? And uh, for Charlie, um, can you just walk us through what kind of weather um, conditions need to be in Florida to roll out this 322-foot tall booster? Thanks. Irene, I'm going to let Charlie tell you both the dates for the uh, cryo loading for wet dress and also the constraints for the rollout. Those are okay, both great thanks. questions. Thank you. All right. So, um, provided that we uh, roll and everything is as we expect it to be, our call to stations would happen on April 1st, and then our our T0, which of course we're not going to go all the way down to T0. We're going to go uh, down just inside T minus 10 seconds, but that would be on the 3rd, and so we would start our tanking operations uh, that morning. Um, somewhere around 7 o'clock uh, local time, we'll start our tanking operations on the 3rd, and then, of course, we'll go through our tanking ops, uh, get down into terminal count, uh, and, uh, and then we do have, as part of our wet dress, we do intend to uh, do some contingency ops, so we'll go into terminal count, we'll recycle, back to the T-minus 10-minute hold, and then we'll come through terminal count a second time. And so that is all part of our nominal uh, wet dress rehearsal. And again, all of those activities will happen on the 3rd. Yeah, and Charlie, yeah, Rain, and, and this is, John Honeycutt and I did a lot of shuttle work. We went through a lot of cryo-loadings. Charlie, how do you compare the time it takes us to load this vehicle to, to the shuttle? Um, that's a great question, Tom. So back in shuttle, you probably remember it took about two and a half hours or so to load. Um, we start our loading about eight hours prior. So it's a significantly longer t uh, loading timeline. That's for a couple of reasons. The first is it's a big old stage. And, uh, and so, you know, there's a, there's a lot of hydrogen to go load. It's also there's an upper stage that we didn't have in shuttle, and so we stagger the loads between the core stage and the upper stage. And then let's see weather. Um, so for roll, I think was your question, Irene. So we have, um, we will not roll if there's a greater than 10% chance of lightning within 20 nautical miles. Um, we also look for, um, for hail, and so we have to be, if we won't roll if we have a greater than 5% chance within five nautical miles. Um, we also have some wind restrictions and we have temperature restrictions. And so the wind restrictions is 40 knots peak. Um, uh, and then, we also have uh, temperature, and that's 40 degrees uh, is the low limit, and then 95 degrees on the high. 
I did get my first weather briefing this morning uh, at 745 with the launch weather officer. Uh, we do expect to have a little bit of precip here and, uh, and potentially some inclement weather on Wednesday, but right now the forecast looks really nice for roll on Thursday. So let's all keep our fingers crossed that that weather pattern holds and, uh, and hopefully we'll have a favorable forecast for Thursday. Thank you, Charlie. Next up, we have Bill Harwood with CBS News. Uh, yeah, hi. Just to kind of follow up on that question uh, in comparing the things we're familiar with with Space Shuttle, I know you said you're going to do some testing on the way to the pad. Does that involve any starting and stopping? And how long will it take you from when you start rolling till you're hard down at 39B? And, and I also want to verify that this is going to start at 6 p.m., you know, if all goes well. Thanks. So it's at 5 p.m. is when we expect to have first motion. Um, it is about 11 hours from the time that we have first motion until we get hard down at the pad. Of course, you know, there, is some, there are some stops and starts in there. We're going to come out of the VAB. Uh, again, everybody will get a, a look at this amazing vehicle. I, I personally can't wait to see it roll past the windows of the Launch Control Center, which is where I'll be for, for rollout. Um, we will make a stop just outside the LCC. Uh, we will uh, put the uh, crew access arm in the retract positions. We'll pull that back, and, uh, and then we'll, we'll give a go to continue out to the pad. So there's a little bit of time there while we're stopped and doing that operation. Again, end to end, it's about 11 hours. Of course, we do have, um, you ask about some planned stops. We do have one in the test that John Honeycutt referred to in our dynamic rollout test. We have a speed profile that we'll be going through as part of that. Uh, and we have instrumentation that folks will be monitoring uh, just to, again, take that data, put it back into our models, make sure that we're not seeing anything, any excursions there um, based on day of roll parameters. And, um, but we do have some various speeds that we'll go through. Um, we will have a plan, not only stop for the CAA, but we also have another plan stop uh, along the way. And then, uh, but then we'll get to a cruising speed of about 0.8 uh, miles per hour and we'll take her on to the pad. Yeah, I think if you look real close, your little, the Bill, a little kind of puck-sized things on the side of the vehicle have got wires attached to them, so when it rolls out, yeah, that's what they're doing with that, is they're actually looking to see if the, what the, what, I don't know how you say, the movement of the vehicle as we, as we take it out to the pad. So that's one of the tests we'll be running. Thank you. Next up is Steve Gorman with Reuters. Oh, looks like we lost Steve. Next up then is David Curley with the Discovery Channel. Thank you very much. Uh, Tom, quick question. Um, ASAP has talked about uh, NASA having a almost split personality, becoming commercial crew on one side and running programs on one side, which is you. Uh, do you feel like this is the last one? Is it... Uh, change the way you operate at all, um, and is it, how does it mark the future? Yeah, let me think about that. So, Dave, that, Dave, that's a good question. It's kind of a philosophical question. Um, you know, we talked a little bit, when I started off with today, I talked a little bit about all the parts of the agency that are behind this type of a vehicle and the research and, 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 and testing that the, the women, the men, the, the rocket scientists that we have do to prepare for this type of a vehicle. I think there's going to be kind of a hybrid in the future, and I, you hear this a lot from the agency, that there's this work that the agency needs to do. You know, I live in D.C. We have a National Institute of Health there, and it's got a primary function of being able to do a fundamental research that allows us to do you know, public health. And, you know, for NASA, we have a similar kind of uh, responsibility. We are responsible for the civilian space program of this country and our, our partnerships with other countries. And so that we'll always have that investment. We're always going to have these people, and they help out with all the programs, not only with the program that I represent, but the other programs that you see that are, you know, different types of programs. So I would say that, uh, you know, and even for our program, David, we plan on over a period of time of turning production over to the contractors and having them take more of a lead, and then uh, folks like myself and the folks that you're hearing from today will get on to some new development activities. So I just feel that there will always be this role that the agency has to play. We are the shepherder of the civilian space program for this country. I think we're doing a pretty good job when it comes to that. There will always be these research scientists and these facilities. If you go visit Marshall Space Flight Center where John is, the 
Johnson Space Center where Howard is, you'll see a bunch of buildings there. And in those buildings are actual test equipment and material labs and all these things. I think that part of the agency's responsibility will always continue. And then we will have developments come through, uh, and as one development like our development over a period of time, we'll get through some test flights, we'll do all this analysis and testing, and then we'll begin to turn that over. And both the program managers always have plans to do that right now. And the agency will start focusing on the next set of challenges. So uh, to me, it's always going to be a hybrid. There's always this fundamental responsibility the agency has uh, in, in the aerospace in the industry, and I think we're always going to be doing that. Uh, but we will uh, always look for opportunities to reduce our cost and look for opportunities to kind of begin to handle things over to the um, industry after a period of time and then look for new challenges. So I'm, I'm sorry, Dave, that was a long, a long answer to your short question, but that's, that's kind of how I would see it. Thank you, Tom. Next up, we have Stephen Clark with Spaceflight Now. Hi, thank you for taking my question. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great. Um, I think my question is probably, probably for uh, Charlie as well. Um, can you walk us through what uh, schedule sort of day by day, if you can, after the rollout leading up to that April 1st call to stations? I think there's some servicing and some testing going on at the pad. Uh, what sort of activities over those uh, couple of weeks between the rollout and the WDR? Absolutely, be happy to walk you through that. So we have about two weeks of work. Um, the first thing, you know, I like to say to the team, you know, we only have about, you know, five or six things we have to do, but of course those five or six things are, are fairly complicated. Um, the first is that we're going to get out to the pad and we're going to do all of our connects. So we'll do the connections between the mobile launcher and the pad systems. Uh, and then once we get all those, and that's both data, that's power, that's purge, that's you know all of the the interfaces between the pad and the ML, um, we'll go through those connections. Um, then we get into what we call uh, validations as part of that, so making sure that those services are all ready to go, and uh, and then we get into some of our pad PSET uh, testing activity. Um, we have a number of functional tests we'll do out there. Some of them involve uh, some of our communication. Uh, systems because we want to do it in the pad or the launch environment. Um, we also have some uh, testing that we'll do for EMI and EMC characterization. Uh, once we finish up with what we call our pad PSET testing, um, which is very similar to what we did in the VAB but in the pad environment, so it's some functional tests that we'll do at the pad. We do get into our uh, booster uh, servicing ops and we'll do our servicing of the boosters. We'll load the hydrazine there. And then we'll get into our wet dress uh, preps, and then we'll get into wet dress itself, which will run about two days. It'll it'll very closely uh, follow what we would do for launch countdown. So again, um, you know, it's limited to about five or six things. Of course, there'll be some other local work in there that'll get sleeved in as well. But but those are kind of the the five big things that that precede wet dress. Thank you, Charlie. Next up, we have Will Robinson Smith with Spectrum News 13. Hi, uh, thanks again for doing this for us. Um, question I suppose for Charlie, um, following the work that's gonna be done on the third, at what point would then the rocket be rolled back to uh, the VAB for its final work and checkout? Thanks. Let's see, um, just looking at the schedule, so we do have a, uh, a set of work that is planned, of course, after we get through our wet dress uh, objectives, we go through and we drain inert, uh, make sure that we got everything saved, uh, ready to, um, to finish up our wet dress, I would say post-ops. Um, we also have some deservicing of the boosters that we'll do before we roll back, and then we get right into our preps uh, for roll. And just kind of looking at the schedule here, it's about, um, it's a little over a week or so that we've got um, work there. It's about eight days of work, eight or nine days of work planned. Yeah, and of course, Will, you know, we'll wait and see what comes out of wet dress. We could learn something new, and there's always these chances that we'll spend a little more time on wet dress or something coming out of wet dress I have to spend a little more time on. So generally speaking, that's the timeline of the events, and we're hope 
to have that kind of a timeline, but we also recognize that it's a highly complicated vehicle and a very complicated machine called the ML. It looks like a Star Wars thing as far as I'm concerned. But, and so we'll wait and see what comes out of the white dress. And then that's the point I think we'll be in a good position as an agency to set a launch date. And it's only two weeks, you know, it's a couple weeks away, so we're really getting close to being able to do that for you. Next up, we have Steve Gorman with Reuters. Yeah, hi. Uh, can you, have you heard okay? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. So um, I guess this is a question for uh, uh, Mr. Whitmire. I, my question is uh, if whether uh, with the uh, uh, in sort of heightened tensions between the United States and, and Russia at the moment, and particularly with some of the uh, kind of rather bellicose uh, statements that have been made by uh, the head of Roscosmos uh, in the last couple of weeks, whether that's had any effect on operations, uh, you know, cooperation between NASA and, and Roscosmos, particularly on the on the uh, on the uh, as it pertains to the International Space Station, whether crew exchange talks are still underway, whether talks are still underway to, for uh, w with Russia on on um, extending the life of of uh, the, the National Space Station beyond 2024, you know, whether there's still exchanges of astronauts and cosmonauts between Baikonur and 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 uh, and Johnson Space Center and things like that. Yeah, Steve, I know those are really important questions, and uh, you know Tony will be able to kind of redirect you folks to the parts of the agency that are directly involved in that, and can provide you the best answer. It's a great question. We want to make sure we you hear from the folks that are leading the station program, and so if you uh, check over offline, we'll make sure we'll, we'll point you in the right direction. Yes, absolutely, Steve. You can um, message me and the rest of the PAO team after this, and we'll point you in that right direction. Next up, we have Ramin Skiba with Wired Magazine. Um, hi, I, I have a lot of questions, but I, I, I'll, I'll stick to one. Um, I think uh, this one is for uh, Charlie. Um, so I'm wondering, you know, uh, for um, it, like how much of this will be yeah, televised, and you know, what will there be for you know for viewers to, to be able to see? Hey, this is Tony with NASA PAO. So we are planning on live streaming the event um, for wet dress rehearsal and for rollout, and we will make sure to send that information out to the media so that they can tune in um, as followed. Thank you. Next up, we have Jim Siegel with NASA Tech. Uh, hi, uh, thank you for uh, taking my question and thank you for doing this event for us. I recall uh, with excitement a few years ago when Artemis was uh, f first announced and uh, that the plan had been to uh, land uh, the first moon, uh, first woman on the moon uh, sometime in the 2024 uh, frame or so. And I wondered what the latest uh, timing might be uh, for, for this, first of all, for Artemis 1 to launch and then uh, beyond that, Artemis II and so on. Yeah, Jim, this is time. Let me take a uh, cut at that. And, uh, you know, first of all, I have a counterpart who works over in the, um, the at the campaign level, Mark Karasich, and he's the best person to talk about the uh, lunar mission that we come coming up on Artemis III. We're really excited about this first woman and first person of color to land and the lunar surface, which we really think is an important part of what this agency does, and so we're really proud of that. Uh, Artemis One, of course, we're hoping to know in a couple of weeks. We'll do a wet dress rehearsal. Charlie will help us out, and we'll get through wet dress, and we'll be able to set a date for you for Artemis One. Two is uh, currently in the 24 time frame, and uh, we uh, will, as we get closer to Artemis Two, we'll be more specific on dates and times. And then three is coming in after that, uh, and it will, I don't want to give a date right now, but I, I would ask Mark to provide that information to you. You know, we're also doing that in partnership with a, 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 a national landing capability, so we're really excited about that mission. But I would almost say, I, I actually uh, am a support Mark. I provide a service, service to Mark for that integrated mission, and we can kind of point that correct, you know, question in his direction and give you more specific information on that. Thank you. Next up, we have Jim McDade with 1819 News. Good evening. Uh, my question is uh, directed at John Honeycutt, but first I want to say congratulations to all of you for leading your respective teams through the difficult years of a COVID pandemic, funding battles, related work stoppages, and all of the other difficulties you faced, but congratulations on that. Uh, John, uh, I'm old enough to remember 
when that first Saturn V test vehicle rolled out of the VAB back in May of 1966. That was 56 years ago, believe it or not. Uh, I want to know basically uh, how many people from Huntsville will be working uh, this wet test, and if you could briefly describe what the role of the Huntsville team will be. Thank you. Yeah, I can. I'll certainly take a shot at that, and I don't. I don't have the exact numbers, but we can follow up with that at some point. But it's uh, it's it's on the order of probably um, 200 or something like that. Um, we'll, we've got a what we call a Huntsville Operations Support Center um, that'll be staffed primarily with uh, engineering support for the mission management team. Uh, as well as the engineering team that are boots on the ground uh, here to support as uh, really the design center and any work through any issues uh, that we may, may see on day of launch. Charlie, you want to add something? Yeah, so what I would add to that is, you know, we're, as a, as a launch director and a launch control team, we are really blessed to have um, a great group of within our team, our support team, both for Orion and for SLS. And so when we have any kind of anomaly discussions or anything that comes up, the design centers are very much a part of those discussions as we work our way through uh, any challenges and we resolve them, put them behind us, develop flight rationale. Uh, so, you know, when we think about it, while, yes, there are folks that are sitting in, in Huntsville and there are folks that are sitting at the Johnson Space Center and in other, um, you know, remote sites from, from our suppliers across, um, across all of our programs, you know, we really work as one team on launch day. And to me, that's such a gift as a launch director is to know that you've got that ops team and you've got that design center and that engineering support team behind you. And so that's why I have such confidence in whatever, you know, we see on either wet dress or launch day, we're going to be ready for it. Yeah, I, I, Jim, I agree with Charlie on this one, too. We, uh, John, the Marshall Space Flight Center team is outstanding, just as in the Johnson team is outstanding, too. You know, David had a question earlier about what's the future of the agency, and I can tell you that that's the agency's future is strong, and it's that type of uh, engineering expertise and technical expertise that people like Charlie rely on on launch date. Is, it's just such a vital part of what we're doing, and we, we really think there's a strong future for that. I'm, I'm like Charlie, very proud to have known these folks and, and work with these folks and see the work they do. Uh, cryo-loading is really tricky stuff. Engine start sequence is one of the most amazing things. That this machine that we have is probably one of the most complicated machines in the world, and uh, these, these folks are really, really great. And so, you know, I, I don't know if I did a good enough job when I first started talking about all the different folks throughout the agency and our industry team that are part of this activity. I wish I could have spent more time because really it's those folks that help make this happen, and uh, John and Howard represent uh, some just incredible people. I agree with Charlie. I could be uh, prouder to have them as part of our team. Thank you. Next up, we have Chelsea Goad with Space.com. Hi, thank you so much for taking my question. Uh, so obviously there's always a lot of excitement when the crawler gets to come out. Uh, but seeing as the vehicle, while still functioning incredibly well, uh, is over 50 years old, um, what are the biggest risks or challenges that are present um, during a rollout, especially a rollout with such uh, a large launch vehicle? Yeah, Chelsea, uh, let me start and then I'll talk to yeah, it's been 50 years since we've sent a, a crew-capable vehicle to the moon, and it's, I wasn't here for the Saturn days. I always wished I had uh, had a chance to, to see uh, one of the Saturn launches. It would have been spectacular. This vehicle is that, that big. I live in Washington, D.C. It's a little bit shorter than the Washington Monument, so if you ever look, if you ever do a chance to walk around Washington, D.C., it's a really big vehicle. And, it, you know, even with that, it takes every ounce of performance that we can provide to be able to do these missions. Mike will tell you that we're always kind of checking every ounce in the vehicle to make sure we're getting the best possible performance. But, I, you know, I made the Star Wars analogy. The crawler, the crawler transporter, if you ever see it up close, is the most phenomenal thing I've ever seen. The mobile launcher is just an incredible uh, structure, and we move that whole uh, crawler transporter uh, and mobile launcher with a rocket as big as the Saturn V out to the pad. So, Charlie, that is quite an incredible feat. Uh, any thoughts on that? I mean, it's really, it, it, believe me, this is a very different vehicle than what we normally see here in Florida and has been something like this for quite some time, so it's going to be pretty cool. Oh, it's going to be amazing. Um, and with respect to the crawler, I mean, while she has been in operation for 50-plus uh, years, I mean, she underwent 
significant upgrade as part of getting ready for this vehicle. And, you know, we've rolled EML to the pad a number of times, never seen an issue with the crawler. Um, we've also gone and done crawler weight conditioning where we actually loaded it up even heavier than we expect it to be on roll day. And so, uh, you know, the, while, um, while the original uh, crawler uh, was over 50 years ago, I mean, we have done significant upgrades in preparation for, uh, for rolling this vehicle to the pad and for Artemis operations. Thank you. We have time for one final question. Michael Greshko from National Geographic, your line is now open. Thank you so much. I think this is a perhaps a group question, though, Tom and Charlie, I'd love your thoughts on this. You know, this moment obviously fits into a legacy of firsts going back more than 50 years to Apollo 4, referenced earlier, um, and STS-1. You know, on a personal note, how do you reflect on Artemis One, SLS Orion's place within that legacy. And if you've had the chance to have these conversations, what has it been like to speak with people who are in your shoes with Saturn V and shuttle? I used to be the deputy for at this time. I used to be the deputy for safety uh, in, uh, for the agency. And one of the things we got to do is participate in the Tom Stafford Committee. So I used to talk to Tom Stafford about this stuff. And I can tell you, every generation has its moment. This is going to be an incredible moment for this generation. I seriously doubt anybody here Thursday will forget this moment in their career. John and I have done a lot of shuttle stuff, as Charlie has too, and uh, and every Mike and Howard have a lot of experience as well. So we've all had an opportunity to see some pretty incredible things throughout our career. Uh, I think this is really going to stand out as 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 as, as just uh, you know you get you get in this business you kind of get size and scale you kind of get kind of used to a certain size and scale I think we were pretty well turned uh, to that with, during the shuttle program and every time I see this vehicle the, and and, I, and I'll let Charlie and and, and Howard and and uh, Mike and uh, uh, John talk about this you catch your breath I've never seen a vehicle that when you see it and we, we're, we're privileged we get to see it before we brought it out for its, its unveiling. But every time I've seen it or people we've talked to have really seen the vehicle up close, it just catches your breath. And I, I don't have any better way to describe it. Charlie, what do you have any thoughts on that? Or? Well, let's see. You know, um, I do have some thoughts on it. So the, the first thing is, is that when you ask, do we ever have an opportunity to talk to folks that were there for the first, I am really lucky that I have two individuals on my launch team that supported STS-1 and that were in the firing room on the day that we launched STS-1 uh, and that went through all of the testing. And so I was just talking to one of them today, as a matter of fact. So I am I'm really blessed that way um, that, you know, I have that expertise back from STS-1 and they can share. And then one of the other things when you talk about great days in your career, you know, I, I feel, I've used the word blessed a number of times as, as part of this press conference, but that is, really heartfelt for me. And one of the days that, that I, I felt really blessed, I would say, is, you know, when, back for the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11, we invited back the launch team to firing room one, um, this is the very same firing room that we're going to launch Artemis one from. And we invited that team back. And we, um, we put up our, you know, in the, in the firing room, we have these console signs. So we put the console signs up and we ask, you know, for the teams that work prop back in Apollo to find the prop team and the folks that were test conductors to find the, and we had an opportunity to visit with all of them. It was, it was one, it was a great day. And it was a great day for a number of reasons. Um, but the biggest part was really understanding, you know, where they were at on that day, on that launch day, and them sharing with us and what that felt like and, and, you know, the, even some of the, you know, the, the, the change traffic and, and things that they were dealing with as they got ready for that launch. Uh, and it was, it, it was a, a wonderful day. And so have I had that opportunity? Yes, I've had that opportunity with some STS-1 uh, folks. Um, Bob Seek, I still speak with him re regularly. Uh, former launch director also around for STS-1, also around during Apollo. So, um, so how do we fit in uh, to all that? I don't know if I've sorted through, you know, how, how we fit versus where they were, but what I will say is it's great, you know, in this NASA family of ours, it's great to be able to reach back, um, learn from others, hear their perspective, see how it lines up with where you are. And one of the things that I told our team just today as we wrapped up the pretest is take a moment, 
take a moment in these days, take a moment on Thursday and appreciate where you are and appreciate this moment because being a first doesn't come along that often in your career. Thank you all for joining us today. You can listen to a replay of this teleconference online by visiting the Media Resources tab at nasa.gov forward slash Artemis dash one later this afternoon. Artemis One will be the first in a series of increasingly complex missions that will pave the way for missions with astronauts as we prepare for human missions to explore Mars. The SLS rocket and the agency's Orion spacecraft, along with the exploration ground systems at Kennedy, will be the backbone of NASA's Artemis missions to take human exploration farther into space than ever before. To learn more about Artemis, follow our progress to the pad online at nasa.gov forward slash Artemis dash one. Thanks again, and that will conclude our call. That concludes today's conference. Thank you for participating. Speakers, please stand by for a moment for your post-conference. Thank you.